Hey guys, this is Eli from Mobox. In this breakdown video, we are going to take a look at how we created the 3D animations for the Perseverance rover video on the Real Engineering channel. So, the first thing we had to do was getting a hold of the 3D model instead of trying to redo it on our own. Good thing is that NASA does provide such model, although it is a bit simplified compared to the real thing. Judging by the file formats, that's probably also because it may be intended to be used for augmented reality. The bad part about this is that these file formats don't really work in Cinema 4D at all. So after some quick research, I noticed these models work very well on Sketchfab. And I also know Sketchfab has an import plugin that works pretty well in Cinema 4D. So I uploaded the thing on Sketchfab and then imported it back in with the plugin. Now with the native render system it looked as expected, but the materials had to be converted to Octane. Octane has a function for that, to convert the materials, but in my opinion it does a bad job converting metallic and reflective materials. So I converted them all manually, just copying the textures from the originals and also picking their reflection strengths and just manually adding that in there. So that took a while of course, but in the end it was the best thing to do, especially for the different metal parts, because Octane has its own way to do these things and it just looks way more realistic if you do it the right way. The next part, which also scared me the most, was rigging the wheels. For this it wasn't just a car where the wheel suspension is hidden and the road is flat. The wheels had to follow the bumps on the terrain and the suspension had to move accordingly. So to get the wheels to roll, I first tried using some pure espresso. But that got complicated and it only worked driving in one direction, which is extremely limiting. Good thing something like the Rollet plugin exists, for free. It instantly knows how big your wheel is and it will also follow the train and it will give you a very realistic result. Creating the suspensions rig was a bit more challenging to say the least, because I usually avoid rigging like the plague. So I got rid of everything but just kept one side of the wheel suspension so I could focus better. Then my first attempt was to use joints in an IK chain, starting from the top centerpiece and working their way down to the wheels. Actually, that worked surprisingly well using the goal nulls it generates, but my wheels should define where things are going, because they'll stick to the ground using the Rollet plugin. Adding some margin to the distance of the wheels wouldn't work because the legs are angled, so if it moves up or down, it also moves left and right a bit, and the whole calculation just stops working. Maybe someone could figure out a formula for that, but I'm not too good at math anyway. So if my cloudy head can make sense out of this, I had to reverse the bone structure. But that also means I have multiple bone structures going into one centerpiece. I tried connecting them together using the constraint tag so the joint goals stuck together. But that was a mess as well. It would also have the same issues with the wheels not being able to lead the rig. So my next big brain move was to combine both systems. The joint does start at the top center part and goes to the front wheel. Its endpoint or goal is exactly lined up with the center of the wheel this time and using Expresso I have it follow only the height position of the wheel. For the wheels in the back it was a bit different because it kind of branches off in its own way. So my center point wasn't actually at the top but in between the different legs. For the middle wheel I used a reversed bone structure starting from the wheel and going to the suspension. That also made it the most reliable wheel in terms of behavior. Using some constraint tags, I was also able to link the different parts together. So that was a wild ride, no pun intended, but it is not perfect. There are some limits in the range of height the wheels can go without disconnecting from the suspension. It has to do with that same thing where the wheels should go left and right when going up and down, but that was just too much of a hassle combined with Rollet, so it was just easier to hide the errors. Also, forget about the wheels turning, this boy will only run in a straight line. Now considering how high res and huge my landscape was about to be, Rollet would have a hard time calculating the wheel placements on all these polygons. So for every scene I made sure to cut out the part where the rover would run on and just link it to that small part instead. But even then it was still very slow in the viewport, so I kept the plugin disabled whenever I wasn't rendering or fine tuning the landscape under the wheels. Creating the environment was the fun part, also the part I feel most at home. It is the kind of stuff I've been doing for the past two years or so. To get started, I used the landscape object built in Cinema 4D, made sure it was huge and had a lot of polygons. Then I started combining all kinds of noise displacement deformers. 
That way it is easy to generate a nice random landscape, which is still easy to tweak using these deformer settings. Once that looked okay, I went searching for some nice camera angles that had a good composition and also keeping in mind the rover would be able to ride on it. For the compositions there's a lot to talk about, but that could be a video on its own. Let's keep it to the concept of having a foreground, middle ground and background. To enhance the background portion I also added random large landscapes in the distance. Then adding an octane daylight and volumetric fog makes this effect more obvious because every mountain becomes a bit less visible. It is also important to use the right angle of the sunlight so things don't look flat. I mostly used a low sunset angle to get a lot of shadows. The last thing you would want to happen is having the light come from the back, so from behind the camera, because that makes things look super flat. To get the landscape to look good, I used a great texture pack. I'm not going to tell you which one exactly, so we don't all start using the same thing, but it is from a pretty well known site. Those who really want to know will figure it out watching this video. The displacement maps on these textures are very high res. Usually that slows down the whole workflow. But with the RTX 3090 Nvidia hooked this up with, it wasn't a problem at all. Then using the color correction node from Octane, I was also able to adjust the different textures their color, so they kind of fit it more together instead of looking like a tropical beach without water. For the best result, I made all of them pretty dull and just relied on adding more color in post. To get a nice mixed result between these materials, so the rocks and the sand, I adjusted the middle height of their displacement maps. So you basically have the same landscape object duplicated on top of each other, each time with a different texture, and only adjust the displacements. To break things up even more, I also used the sculpt tools to raise and lower certain parts of the landscape of course. To make it complete, I added the final seasoning by adding some easter eggs that kind of serve as a watermark. Because you know, people like to steal stuff. For the animations, it wasn't really anything special. I was able to just animate the movement of the rover, its body, and Rick would do the rest. For the camera, I used a target tag that was linked to a separate null instead of linking it directly to the rover itself. That way it was easy to animate that null when I had to compensate the framing of the shot for example. Now one more thing I want to pay some attention to is the post-processing of these renders. Because to be honest, they wouldn't look so good if we didn't do any of that. I intentionally kept the colors very bland, so everything would match up better, but that also makes it look worse at the same time. But using some of the built-in features of the Octane camera, it is quite easy to experiment. For example, you can import any LUT you want, but you can also just use one of the many default ones. Also adding some bloom and glare is the typical Octane thing to do, maybe a bit overused even, but it just really helps making things a bit more realistic instead of over sharpened and just too obvious. Because of the different sun settings and camera angles in all of the shots, it was also needed to adjust the gamma and exposure to compensate the brightness or the lack of contrast sometimes. For some shots I even kind of lost control because too many things were changing and had to be adjusted, so I tried keeping it simple instead and just did the color correction in Premiere. So because this was a bit of a larger project, there was also a lot to render, over 5000 frames for just the final versions, but using the RTX 3090 it was surprisingly fast. Almost all frames were done under a minute per frame at full HD. So even for the previews I just did a full rest render overnight. Especially the combination of a lot of displacements, fog and path tracing can get quite slow to render. But because I used a bit of depth of field in the camera settings, everything in the background should be smoothed out anyway. So combining that with the AI denoiser of Octane, I was able to render with quite a low amount of samples and just let the denoiser smooth out the background. I think that's certainly a tip you may want to remember. Talking about the AI denoiser, in the stable builds of Octane it doesn't work with the latest series of Nvidia cards just yet. So I was lucky they just released their unstable version not so long ago. However, I did have some issues midway through the early renders. My GPU started giving artifacts on the screen and it also remained doing that when not rendering. After looking in the performance stats of the card, I noticed the temperature is very stable, but it kind of gets overclocked out of the box and it likes to peak the clock speeds. Maybe the renders made it peak too long and something went wrong there, but I resolved the issues using MSI Afterburner and underclocking the card a bit. Surprisingly, playing video games is also a bit smoother this way than it was before. 
So what I want to tell you with this is that you may want to watch out using these cards under heavy stress and maybe it is not a bad idea to underclock them slightly during long and heavy tasks. Other than that, I had a lot of fun working on these animations for Real Engineering and I suggest you check out the video on their channel. So I hope this breakdown gave you some insight on how these things are being created. Thanks for watching and I will catch you in the next video.